Magic to Booking Theorems. <laughs> So we looked at uh, scalar functions and constructed uh, the up level for our own. Okay, the way we did that, or, so this is uh, a function from M into the real line. So if I take T M, T, sorry, T F, and T F is going to be um, T M into T R, which is R plus R. Okay. And then let's say that's fiber. Then uh, uh, we compose that with the projection onto the second component of that and with the function of the point. Uh, so this is now a thing, uh, a thing that acts from TM into straight into R uh, over every point of the uh, So at every point it's in R. But in general, takes the value of the second, which is a change vector, and that takes it into a real line, which doesn't take the value of the direction of the projection to one direction. Uh, now, I want to check that it's actually the same thing over and over. And so, DF uh, acting on some vector field is If I act on a vector field that's multiplied by
Prove what? see any more tensors or one forms or whatever in this talk. Um, but let's start with uh, one of the most fundamental theorems about embedded submanifolds, which is the Whitney embedding theorem. Uh, and the statement, well, there's a bunch of statements about of, regarding the Whitney embedding theorem that are consecutively stronger. Uh, the weakest version is that, let's say you have any M dimensional smooth manifold, capital M, uh, and it can be the weakest, in the weakest version of Whitney embedding, smoothly embedded. Uh, into a Euclidean space Rn of sufficiently large n. Uh, we'll, 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 that's the stronger version of the statement. Yeah, uh, a, sl a slightly different version, for, not for embeddings, but for immersions, is that can be smoothly immersed in R 2M. Uh, an even stronger version of this is R 2M plus oh, minus one. So all you need is for a, for a M dimensional manifold, the number of extra dimensions you need to smoothly immerse it is M minus one. And if you want to embed it instead. You need one more dimension than this, which is R2M plus one, or in the stronger version, R2M. So essentially the point being that any abstract manifold can be thought of as some sort of isomorphism class of submanifolds of Euclidean spaces. Um, Arnold. Uh, so, so for the for the most part of this and later, we're mostly just going to use the first version. Some being able to embed in some Rn for sufficiently large n suffices. You don't really need these limits on what n can possibly be. Uh, and the idea of the proof is to take this manifold and write it uh, define uh, basically map each of the charts into coordinate balls and then try and wrap the coordinate balls around themselves by using extra dimensions. So for example, if M is compact, then we can write some finite covering by coordinate balls. Um, so once we have a finite covering, which we're guaranteed to have because M is compact, uh, we can use bump functions, chi i, such that these chi i's become 
identity when restricted to bi, and use these bump functions to patch, patch together into a function that takes this manifold and maps it into some rn given by chi1, phi1 of p. Oh, yes, with this rn, <laughs> comma, chi n, phi n of p as an element of rn when n is the number of coordinate balls you used. And this doesn't show that the, that the number of coordinate balls is going to be at least 2m, but this it, at least this shows an example of the first statement. Oh, sorry, the, the mention of that thing is rn Oh, yes, yes, my bad. Right, right, right. Yes. And one can check that this function f is a smooth immersion. And because m is a compact manifold, a smooth immersion is a smooth embedding. Exactly. And then you try to reduce the number of dimensions as much as you can, which is the hard part of the proof. <laughs> It'll still be 2M. Yeah. No, no, but then they automatically get to the Yeah, fully. Because actually, if you're on that, I think every smooth manifold of dimension M can be covered by. Uh, M plus one uh, simply connected. Uh, you mean compact? compact. You mean compact? But for compact manifolds in particular. I actually think it's all uh, which is weird. Like think of the torus, two dimensional torus, and try to cover it by the beam. Interesting. Oh, uh, an immersion is when the differential of a function is an immersion if the differential is uh, injective. Uh, and an embedding if, wait, what other? Holy shit, I forgot the definition of embedding. An embedding is if you're Ah, yes, 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 yes. If, uh, yeah, uh, if, so if it's an immersion, it's, uh, if the differential is injective, it's an immersion, and it's an embedding if the, um, if the map, if the function is a diffeomorphism onto its image. Yeah, it's complicated. All right. Now the theorem. We'll, we'll have a lot of theorems in this, in today's lecture, with very few proofs. Um, so this theorem says that any continuous function f, continuous, not smooth, from the manifold m to some r k has a smooth approximation given by f tilde, which is the infinity function. And in particular, when I say approximation, what I mean is that for any delta, which is a continuous function from m to r plus, positive value continuous function, uh, mod f of p minus f tilde of p is less than delta of p for all p in n. So this, so this, this last sentence in particular, the last line is 
usually denoted as f tilde being delta close to f. So a smooth approximation is that for any delta, which is a positive function on the manifold, there exists a smooth function. Uh, the, uh, the smooth function f tilde is delta close to f. Um, the proof of this is, let's say you take a countable locally finite open covering of the manifold. with the use small enough such that the values of this function f uh, rest uh, when restricted to ui uh, stay within uh, within the function delta of pi on this ui for for any point p in the ui so what you're doing is you're taking in a ui that's sufficiently small you're looking at all the points p on this on this sufficiently small chart you're looking at you consider the values of this function delta on the sufficiently small chart and make sure that u is small enough that the the values of the function remain within this range of delta pi for for every pi uh, so once you have this Well, I mean, I, I think you needed to, to hold for all PI because then otherwise this condition won't, uh, once you construct a function with bump, bump maps, this may not necessarily hold. And, and say, and pick a neighborhood such that the values of are within you know, plus minus delta and by defining the right criteria. Then those values between each other are within delta. Right. Right, 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 right. Right. Well, yeah, so I guess for some P and U will work. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, so let's say you have this such an, an open covering that obeys this property. We can construct a partition of unity, call it chi i, that is subordinate to the covering u i. And by subordinate, I mean the partitions are one on, uh, well, chi i is one on the corresponding u i and may not be everywhere, anywhere else. And at any point, there's only a finite number in the definition of the definition of partition of unity is that at any point there's only a finite number of chi's uh, that add to one. Uh, and using this partition of unity, we can define f tilde as sum over i chi i times f of pi at every point. And once, because uh, our covering ui obeys this property, it's clear that f tilde is delta close to f. And that's the proof. Exactly. 
Well, the point of the kaya is to stitch together these patches to make it smooth. Exactly. That's why it's a partition of unity. Yes, but it's a partition of unity subordinate to UI. So if if like the point PI is outside of some particular U, the corresponding chi on that at that point will be zero. Mm -hmm. So then the, you'll have two chi's over there that add up, add up to one. Oh, so you, you can introduce like a double PI. So like in, in the overlapping point, the PI is PI is going to be the same, so the F's just factor out and this and it sums to one. Well, Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. So if you imagine you have like two No, but then the, the the fact that you're covering obeys this property is what will prevent that. Okay. So your point is such that um, such that yeah, I think I think you do need for all pi to to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, the function doesn't blow up blow up wildly outside the, the intersection. He says it's between two different Yeah. Questions? Right. So then that's the theorem. And then we have another definition, which is that of a normal bundle. So suppose um, we have a manifold M embedded into some Rn. Uh, and pick a point P in the manifold. The fibers of the normal bundle are defined as NPM is the orthogonal complement of the tangent space and as embedded into Rn. So this is the orthogonal complement uh, of with respect to the standard inner product on Rn, because the tangent space can be viewed as a subset of Rn under this embedding. Uh, secondly, so then you can define the normal bundle as the disjoint union with of all these fibers. Uh, and define the transition functions appropriately. And then this will be an n-dimensional uh, embedded submanifold of DRN, where n is the dimension of the Euclidean space that the manifold was embedded into. Does everyone see why this is n? Why the dimension of NM is N? Right, 
exactly. So locally, it's a product of M, some open set of M, which is an M-dimensional subspace uh, of uh, well subset of Rn, and times NPM. And NP since NPM is the orthogonal complement of the tangent space in Rn, and the tangent space has dimension M, NPM is going to has the dimension have dimension n minus M, and when you add add up the two, you get N. Exactly. <laughs> I suppose I've never seen the proof of the theorem. Never got myself. Um, so, um, on the previous slide, you had the theorem that the tangent space of the Mm -hmm. And then, uh, why is it that uh, you are finally uh, going to have the manifold? Oh, because this is a fiber. NP is just the fiber over M. Yeah. And M has the manifold M has dimension M. Okay. So locally on a chart, it's just some open set of U. So open set of M cross NPM for some P. It's, Exactly. So it's it's normal bundle is literally just R n minus the or origin on the coordinates. Or R three minus the origin. All right. Uh, more definition based on the normal bundle. We define the tubular neighborhood of a manifold, which is embedded into Rn. So this is defined as an open neighborhood, U that contains M, uh, an open neighborhood in Rn, such that U is diffeomorphic to the normal bundle. Yeah. yeah, that's that's exactly what it does. So for, so for example, let's say you have R3 and you have a circle embedded in R3. The normal bundle of the circle is going to be, so let's say that the normal the normal space at a point is going to be the plane of vectors that are perpendicular to this line. Yeah, so all you're doing is making this slightly fat, turning it into a torus. Uh, and because there's an open neighborhood, this is diffeomorphic too. Yeah, but the tube has to be sufficiently thin, right? So the yeah. dimensions are pretty Like this curve, and I draw a tube around it. If it's thin, it will be diffeomorphic to the normal. It's too thick, I will we'll grab like this whole thing. Right? Exactly. And then it'll always not be thick and Exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, because M is embedded into RN, you can you'll always have. Well, that's the next theorem. We have a theorem which guarantees us that a tubular neighborhood always exists. For obvious reasons, it's called the tubular neighborhood theorem. Uh, and the statement is that every embedded submanifold M of Rn has a tubular neighborhood. And well, a rough idea of the proof is this. So the normal bundle M, M can be, is, uh, as we saw earlier, is an embedded sum manifold. Uh, 
Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> of the tangent space of Rn, which is equivalent to Rn cross Rn. Uh, and using this, we can consider a function G that takes the normal bundle and maps it into Rn. And what it does is, uh, if viewing the normal bundle as a subset of Rn, its points are two elements x comma v, uh, and it maps it into the element x plus v. X and v are x is a vector in Rn, and so is v. So you can add them to the two of them and get a vector in Rn. Translating them in the radio direction. Exactly. This works precisely because this thing is n-dimensional and very non-random, basically. Right, exactly, exactly. So, G maps the fiber at a point x in M uh, to the subspace through x that's perpendicular to the tangent space at M. So once again, a diagram, if this is a part of the manifold, the tangent space at this point is here, pretend it's embedded in R3, uh, and G just takes this point and translates it in whatever directions, and gives you some sort of a circle around this, around this point. Uh, now, the zero section in NM, which is well, the, the section that maps uh, that maps every point to the fibers, the, the zero, the null fiber in the normal space at that point. Uh, we saw last time that this is diffeomorphic to the manifold itself. Um, Secondly, using this fact, G can be shown to be a local diffeomorphism on a neighborhood of the zero section. Uh, local diffeomorphism of NM onto a neighborhood of the zero section. Oh, right, right, right. Wait. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Right, 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 right. Right, so. But the reason why it's used is because we already know it's different microsm on M, right? And we have the, the just the property of the function is a different microsm at a point, it's a different microsm in the neighborhood of that point. Right? So that's just one thing. Yeah. All right. Okay, so using this, I can show that there exists a neighborhood of the zero section within the normal bundle uh, on which G is a diffeomorphism between a neighborhood of M and the neighborhood of the zero section. This basically just follows from the fact that G is a local diffeomorphism from the neighborhood of the zero section into some subset of R2N. Yeah, that's just the definition of local diffeomorphism. And well, we also have that any neighbor. So this just implies that any neighborhood of the zero section of the vector bundle 
is diffeomorphic to the entire bundle. Oh, yeah. Oops, sorry. Yeah, so, I mean, any neighborhood of the zero section, because it's a vector space, it can always scale the fibers correspondingly and make a diffeomorphism into the entire bundle. Um, and using this fact and this fact, you clearly have that G, uh, whatever restriction you need here to turn G into a diffeomorphism is going to give you a tubular neighborhood of the manifold M because that would then be a diffeomorphism of uh, diffeomorphic to the normal bundle. Well, you do have to make it smooth enough. Like you can't take arbitrary neighborhoods of every point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you need the metric? Yeah, definitely. You just have to develop a different option. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Wait, you're not adding a 2n. Oh, you can, you, we're, we're writing R2n as Rn cross Rn, and then x is an element of Rn, v is an element of the second copy of Rn, and you're adding those two together. <laughs> you wrote the notes. <laughs> you wrote this proof. <laughs> So now that we know a tubular neighborhood exists for any embedded submanifold, any tubular neighborhood U of M embedded into Rn can be retracted uh, by a smooth submersion. Uh, in other words, there exists a map pi from u into m that is such that when restricted to m in u, this is just the identity on m, and pi is a smooth submersion. Can anyone tell me what pi is? Uh, so, I mean, uh, let's say you have the normal bundle of M, you have this construction that shows that the tubular neighborhood always exists. What what maps can I compose to give a smooth submersion by? Mm-hmm. So just take the inverse of that. Right. So G inverse maps a point in the tubular neighborhood into the normal bundle, but now we want to map it back into M. 
What do we need for that? This projection. So it's pi and m. We define this as pi, and this is a smooth submersion. Questions? Yeah. Well, just the fact that it's diffeomorphic to at NM. So, yeah. So you can, you, G, G is just a, the diffeomorphism that shows up in the definition of a T with a neighborhood. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's just a reverse process. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. Another major theorem the Whitney approximation theorem this time. Uh, let's say you have a continuous function, once again, continuous, not smooth, between two manifolds N and M. Uh, which are smooth manifolds. Uh, <laughs> F is homotopic to a smooth function. <laughs> Wait, was that even my phone? <laughs> All right, so this is a, so the Whitney approximation theorem guarantees that you can Instead of working with continuous maps between smooth manifolds, you can work with an approximate, an approximation to that map, which is a smooth map. And this approximation will be homotopic to the smooth map. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And the proof of this uses all the machi machinery we built up so far. So first of all, use Whitney embedding to embed M into Rn for some sufficiently large N. Uh, let's say... Yes, M is the code name here. Uh, and pick a tubular neighborhood U of M. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, we do have Whitney's embedding theorem. <laughs> uh, and our previous theorem guarantees that we'll have a retraction from U into M. And then the approximation theorem for continuous functions from M to R guarantees that, suppose, okay, uh, anyway, now I pick some function delta, which is a smooth positive real valued function on, a continuous positive real valued function on M, and define delta such that delta at a point X is the supremum of all epsilons that are less than or equal to one, such that the corresponding epsilon ball around X is contained in this tubular neighborhood. So the largest coordinate ball of radius epsilon 
the radius of the largest coordinate ball at x that can be contained within u will be the value, just the thickness. Um, Uh, supremum, so just the largest possible value. Well, hmm? yeah, yeah, the least upper bound. <laughs> yes, so the, uh, the least upper bound on all values of epsilon such that this ball can, is contained within you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, big. yeah, whatever. <laughs> just, just take the, just take one of the axes and R two, R two, or whatever. Like R two itself is a tubular neighborhood for that. So, um, yeah. So, and then we define delta tilde as delta composed with F. So now delta tilde is a continuous function. <laughs> it's a pullback onto N. Well, because we picked a continuous function delta. So now, um, uh, given that F is a continuous map from N into, so you can treat F as a continuous map from N, N into U, which is a subset of Rn. And because now there's a map into Rn, you can use the approximation theorem to say that there exists a smooth uh, approximation F tilde from uh, from n into R n. Um, that is delta tilde close to F for this delta tilde defined here, which was a continuous map from n into R plus. Uh, however, the image of this map M tilde is not in M because in general it, it will it will though map into this tubular neighborhood. All right. Uh, and once we have this function f tilde, we can define a homotopy. between F and pi composed with F tilde uh, as just H of a point N comma T where N is in the manifold N and T is in the interval as pi of one minus T F N plus T F tilde So this at t is equal to zero. This homotopy gives you f of n. Oh, uh, so f is basically identical to pi composed with f because pi is an attraction and the value of pi. Um, uh, so if, if, you, if you treat this f Given that it maps into M, you can also treat it as a function of mapping into U. Yeah. Or okay, let me let me call this. Yeah, into this inclusion where inclusion is a map from M to U, where it does what you think it. Questions?
Mm-hmm. What's that? Yeah. I mean, there's just a homotopy between these two. So F is a continu continuous map. We just saw that F tilde is a smooth map because of the approximation theorem. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And also, like this, 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 the fact that the image of F tilde is not the smooth approximation, the smooth homotopic approximation to this function doesn't map into M. It maps into a tubular neighborhood of M. And that, that is what makes this different from the the approximation theorem for Euclidean spaces. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so this would be like a jaggedy brownie and that I'm ready to do a smooth version of that. You can say, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to homotopically do that as fast as I want, basically. Exactly, exactly. All right. Some new definitions now. Moving into transversality in K-theory. Yeah. K groups, real reduced K groups. <laughs> All right. So we define transversality between multiple different sorts of objects. So let's let's say S and S prime are two embedded submanifolds in M. Um, we have a function f from a manifold N to a manifold M, a function G from a manifold N prime into the same manifold M, and let N be a point in N, and prime be a point in N prime, and P be a point in M. I wonder why I didn't use M there, but I don't want to change notation. Mm -hmm. All finite dimensional manifolds are metrizable. Yeah, exactly. We didn't, we didn't, yeah, normal spaces are metrizable. We, did we have that? I suppose, but like the metric may not be super useful. Oh, yeah. Like the the embedding can be something that's horribly complicated and just twisted. Like knots, for example. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> like you can always have a much simpler metric than the one you get from Whitney embedding. Like take take a circle for example. A circle can be embedded into R three in like infinitely different ways in different topological sectors. There's no uh, point pulling back the not <laughs> metric. <laughs> it's like you have a very good metric on a circle, which is very simple. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> All right. Uh, yeah. So those are the things we have. Our ingredients. So the first definition is. The transversality of S and S prime. Transversality is usually denoted by this symbol, so it's an intersection with a vertical line. Um, so S and S prime are said to intersect transversely. Why is this word so big? At a point P in M. And what? <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> At a point P and M, if the tangent space of S at that point and the tangent space of S prime add it to give you the tangent space of P, of M. So the way to think about this, for example, is that if you have some manifold M, if you have a one dimension, let's say M is two dimensional for some reason, uh, if S is a one-dimensional submanifold and S prime is another one-dimensional submanifold, 
uh, and let's say they intersect at a point P. Um, the tangent space of M at P is just the plane. Uh, the, the fact that these two intersect transversely mean that, means that the one-dimensional tangent spaces of both of these uh, sub-manifolds embedded into M are, well, not linear combinations of one another, so not parallel. So then they, the two of them add up together to span the entire plane. Ah, yes, yes. I mean, they, they don't doesn't have they don't have to be disjoined. It's sort of like yeah. Actually, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, this plus is different. So like, if so, if 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 TPS and TPS prime have a yeah, it's just a linear sum. If they have a non-trivial intersection, you're not gonna duplicate the intersection. So another example is just two planes, like Alex said. Oh. Oh. Yeah. So like, if you have a plane and another plane. How the hell do I draw two planes like this? And then they intersect over here as subsets of R3. Uh, so the tangent space at any point of each of these planes is an R2, but they have a non-trivial intersection, which is uh, the tangent spaces have a non-trivial intersection themselves, which is just the, the, the line of intersection of the two planes. Uh, and the direct sum is just going to be R3. So these intersect transversely. So visually, it's literally what you'd think. They, the two man, sub manifolds don't run parallel to each other at the point where they intersect. They cross. Uh, right. So that's transversality of manifolds. The second is transversality of a function with respect to a sub manifold. So F is transverse to S. If the tangent space, uh, so F, remember, is a function from N into M, so, and S is a submanifold of M. So if the tangent space of S at the point F of N plus the push forward of the tangent space of the point N is equal to the tangent space at F of N, of M. So you, exactly. Well, yeah. So if, if the image of M is a submanifold, it has to be transverse to S. So this is like a slightly more general version. And finally, the third one, transversality of two functions, which is, what do you think this is? <laughs> if, the, if, the, if the corresponding push forwards add to the, uh, the tangent space at that point. So a, that's the definition of transversality. And then we have a theorem. If S and S prime are two embedded submanifolds of M and they intersect only transversely. So at every point, at, 
at every intersection point of S and S prime, they intersect transversely. Um, then the intersection of these two is going to be an embedded submanifold of M with co-dimension S intersection S prime given by the sum of the co-dimensions of S and S prime. I'm going to skip the proof of this because it's complicated. There's a reference in the notes if you want to look at it. It'll, it'll be complicated to... Dimensions are not dimensions. Yeah. Co dimension is the difference between the dimension of the embedded sub manifold and the dimension of the manifold. Uh, the 2D stuff? Oh, so, so suppose S and S prime are those two planes in the diagram? Oh, the curves. Okay, so the dimension of S is one, the dimension of S prime is one, the dimension of M is one, uh, is two. So the co-dimension of S and so S intersection S prime is a union of two points, which is a zero-dimensional manifold. So its co-dimension is two, which is the sum of the co-dimension of S and the co-dimension of S prime. Yet another theorem. What is this number? Ten or something? Uh -huh. It's possible for things to intersect not inversely, but still along the vertex. The transversality homotopy theorem. Uh, so let's say you have a function. A smooth function between two manifolds, C infinity and, and M. Uh, any such function is homotopic to some function G, which is also a smooth, a smooth function from this between the same two manifolds, except that G is now required to be transverse to a given sub embedded submanifold S of M. So the function F may not be transverse to S, but you c it's always homo it, al it always is going to be homotopic to a function that's transverse to S. Yeah. It can be any embedded submanifold. So S is given. F is given, and the theorem states that there'll be a G that's homotopic to F, to F and uh, transverse to S. So, for for instance, exactly. Yeah. So, 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 for example, if n is a circle and s is some other curve in in real space, and let's say the image of the circle intersects that curve at some point, 
where this sentence says that there's a homotopic map G such that the image of G is, does not intersect with this loop S. There are transfers, anyway. Yeah, so I'm going to skip the proof of that as well. Um, yeah, exactly. Oh, with the embedding, that's what the note said. Are you sure? But it's similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now we have an important theorem. Uh, for every vector bundle E over some manifold M with projection pi, there exists a vector bundle E prime with projection pi prime over the same base manifold, such that the direct sum, the Whitney sum of E and E prime is trivial, is a trivial bundle. This is what's that? Oh, the Whitney sum is uh, just fiber-wise direct sum, direct sum of fibers at every point. Yeah. So, th so this would also be a vector bundle over M, where the fiber is a direct sum of the fiber of E and the fiber of E prime at every point. If you have Whitney sum, it's a direct sum the rings of the bundle of M. You have the tensor. So like direct sum and Yeah, exactly. So like effectively, you can you can pick a base manifold and take every vector bundle over it, and the, the set of vector bundles over it will form a ring under the Whitney sum and the Whitney product. Um, all right. So ah, right, right, right. Formally include. Yeah, there's a growth and decompletion. Right. All right, so the proof of this is. Hmm? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Just the trivial bundle. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, no, it can't be the trivial bundle because it's like has to trivial fix a di dimension. Bundle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> M cross whatever vector space of whatever dimension. Uh, all right. So the proof of this, we start with picking a neighborhood U in E of the zero section in E. Uh, and then we embed U into Rn using Whitney embedding. Uh, and, and suppose tau u, I'm, I'm using slightly different notation, but let tau u and nu u be the tangent and normal bundles. Of u, with the normal bundle being defined via this embedding. Yeah. Um, right. So let let this be the fiber bundle E, with each of these vertical lines being the fibers. U is going to be this neighborhood of the zero section. This is M. Um, then we embed this into some Rn. Embed all of U.
uh, and of course, M will also map into some submanifold of Rn under this embedding. But, uh, so the picture that I'm reminded of the information, but basically, uh, <laughs> let's think of E as a good mesh thing. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and the best example here. And this is our thing. Yeah. So this is uh, a visual for 2D. Oh, and right. this is still 2D. Right, but this is the exactly. Uh, so we can keep the, the non trivialities in the XY plane and then rotate the fiber into the Z plane. <laughs> <laughs> so to make uh, yeah. All right. So, so correspondingly for this U, there'll be a tangent bundle and the normal bundle. Uh, what is what is this? What kind of bundle is this? Is the Whitney sum of the tangent? Uh, tau is the tangent and nu is the normal. Well, nu n for normal, I guess. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of vector bundle? <laughs> Something more specific than that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's literally just Rn. So there's a trivial bundle. Exactly. Okay, so, so just looking at E might have some non-trivial twisted basis for two U and three U. Doesn't matter. Like there's a basis independent statement. All right. Uh, yeah, exactly. So this is this trivial bundle is literally going to be u cross rn. There's the tangent space at a point and the normal space at a point. They add into rn. Uh, right. Now, let's see. What's the best way to say this? So let's say you have... Let uh, Consider some vector along the fiber of E. So that'll be, there's this manifold M, there's a vector along this fiber. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll do that. Um, and this maps into a vector here uh, under this embedding. Um, so these are going to be These map into tangent vectors to U, but note that the image of this vector is not tangential to M. So, uh, and it, yeah, it cannot be tangential to M in any way. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so these are tangent vectors to U, but with non zero projections onto the normal space of M under this embedding. And this is going to be a subspace of. So the tangents, so uh, the 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 perpendicular, the orthogonal complement of TXM here, means the orthogonal complement as a subspace of TXU. Right. So TXU at this point is say this plane. TXM is this line in this plane. And its orthogonal complement is this. Yeah. So you're only considering the orthogonal complement in TU, not in Rn. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Right. 
Um, so this projection that we saw here provides uh, an isomorphism between E and this thing that I'll call NUM. Let me explain what NUM is. So NM would be the normal bundle of M as embedded into RN, but I can also Im embed M into U through the inclusion map. And as an using that embedding, I can define the normal bundle, which is the union of these orthogonal com uh, complements. The orthogonal complements that lie within the tangent space of U. Exactly, exactly. And that makes it clear why it's a subspace, subset of the tangent bundle of U, sub-manifold or subset, whatever. Um, all right. Now, we have that NUM, which is uh, the, which is essentially this, the, the bundle over M with these normal vectors as fibers, direct sum with new U restricted to M, which is a normal bundle of U, which is a vector, the, the fibers of which are vectors projecting out of the board, but only those fibers that lie over points in M. What is this direct sum going to be as a bundle over M? So the base spaces of both of these bundles are M. What, what do the fibers over M in this direct sum look like? Uh, in what embedding? Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. So you have in in R three you have two directions. One is normal to M in U. The other one is simultaneously normal to M and U. And what we are doing is taking the direct sum of both those directions. So this is just all normal, all normal directions to M, which is why you get a new M here. Uh, and we already had that tau U plus new U is trivial. Restrict to M, and you still get the same same statement. Uh, so we can consider the following direct sum. Uh, or Whitney sum. This is going to be isomorphic to new M direct sum tau M, which is trivial. Uh, now, what was our E? So this normal bundle, uh, you can retract it back to E. Yes, ah, so this is isomorphic to E because of the projection. And whatever remains can be called E prime. And then we have E direct sum E prime is trivial. Any questions? Adding a Mobius strip. Yeah, just itself. And that's that's how you get that there are only two line bundles over the circle, which is the cylinder and the Mobius band. There's no two twists. There's no there's no line bundle with two twists. Exactly. So that that'll give you a plane at every point in the circle, and like it doesn't matter what a twist in a plane is. Yeah. yeah. So, so that'll just be. Like, you know, so they all twist, but still. Exactly. Like, exactly. Uh, 
Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, you can't you can't you can't use that to show that the sum of two Mobius spans is a, is the trivial is or or rather like two twists is trivial, but can you can you do that using the Picard group? The tensor product of the like you can't use this to show that uh, two twists is a trivial line bundle over S1. But can you use like the Picard group? Can you use the tensor product? Yes, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. No, but like whatever you do, you're gonna add a dimension to the line bundle over our Mobius band. So that's not gonna be a line bundle anymore. So like you can't use this to show that uh, the, the Mobius band can be trivialized into a line bundle by adding another twist, but like it can clearly be trivialized into a plane bundle by adding another Mobius band. So now we have one more theorem, which is called the transverse section theorem. And the statement is that suppose E by M is a smooth vector bundle and U naught in E is an open neighborhood of the zero section, which I'll call E zero. Um, and let M prime be a smooth manifold and F be a C infinity function from M prime into E. And the statement is that there exists a smooth section, a sigma from M into E, whose image lies in U. Uh, and such that F is transverse, transversal, transverse to sigma. Oh, U0, sorry. Is it transverse or transversal? Transverse. Transverse. Intersection is transversal. Intersection is transversal. But some manifolds and maps are transverse. Ugh. Oh, we haven't got to K theory yet. And then, this is in any bundle of drawn any map mapping into the bundle, I can always put the section basically I can always take the zero section and deform it a little bit to make it transverse to exactly. the green or something like that. Uh, the proof of this is long and gonna be very hard to mention on the board, but it's there in the notes if you wanna see it. Uh, but I'm gonna skip that. But this gives a few important corollaries. Yeah, it's like it's very easy to just get lost in the notation. I've, I've always hated that notation. <laughs> Yeah, and then you start using vertical lines for such that, and uh, you just, there's no more, there are no more words <laughs> after that. <laughs> anyway, so let E be a vector bundle of rank K. So the dimension of the fiber, the typical fiber is K. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> upside down a vertical line <laughs> and dimension of m is little m the first statement by jp sere how do i pronounce this sir uh is that if k is greater than m then there exists a section sigma that is nowhere zero or no by nowhere zero i mean it doesn't intersect with the zero section at any point so it's image and it, it's image into the the vector bundle if you look at the image projected down to the fibers the fiber the image in the fiber never goes to the zero vector um secondly by induction uh so let, let's say you pick such a section uh remove the corresponding subspace of the vector of the vector space of the yeah the line the line bundle spanned by it uh, you'll get a k minus 1 rank bundle and you can if k minus 1 is still greater than m you can find another section uh that is nowhere zero keep doing that and by induction you can see that there exists a global frame uh of rank k minus m uh which spans a trivial sub bundle of e this is clear proof is pretty straightforward uh let's say the zero section is called sigma not from m into e uh by the previous theorem there exists a sigma that is transverse to sigma not um this implies that the image of sigma uh is transverse to e not which is the image of sigma not um and now we use our codimension theorem to show, to see that the codimension of image of sigma intersection e not is going to be the codimension of the image of sigma plus the codimension of e not the codimension of uh, because the image of sigma is i diffeomorphic to m by the definition of sigma uh the dimension of the image of sigma as a submanifold of e is going to be m uh so its codimension is going to be k and similarly for e not as well so this is going to be 2k which is greater than k plus m any question about this so this is in particular greater than m plus k so image of sigma intersection e not is empty because we have two sub manifolds of the vector bundle whose dimensions add to something greater than the dimension of the vector bundle oh right 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 right, right, right sorry no greater oh oh right right right, right. yeah the co the codimensions add to Well, uh the dimensions add to something less than the dimension of the vector bundle uh and they are transverse uh which means by what alex said earlier that their intersection has to be empty all right so the intersection of the image of sigma with the zero section is uh empty which means that the image of sigma does not go to zero at any point which is which is our statement here so such a section is called a generic section yeah okay. i'm i'm not going to use this generic <laughs> word it's going to get very confusing otherwise yeah the section is the choice of section that's the 
Yeah, <laughs> we'll, that's that's the next case actually. Uh, so if k is equal to m, so for example, the tangent space of a manifold, the tangent bundle, uh, the generic section um, vanishes, which means that you know becomes zero in that sense uh, at most on a discrete. subset of M. Exactly. So note that this is, that the Heddy ball theorem is stronger than this. The Heddy ball theorem states that every section always vanishes at two points. So this is at most in the street. Yes, exactly, exactly. So in, like, in, in the most general case, there could be a section that still doesn't vanish anywhere. But there can't be a section that vanishes on, say, a one-dimensional submanifold. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And you could have fixed a homotopy before you meant that it's a homotopy such that it's, this is true for arbitrarily small c. Uh, sure. Or better yet. But also you can introduce any difference, for instance, in the non sense or any arbitrarily small mm -hmm. neighborhood of the zero section within that. Because then, because you have a global frame for it. Exactly. Yeah. So whenever you can define a global frame for a vector bundle, that vector bundle is going to be trivial. Yeah, no, because... sorry, sorry, sorry. So any non-zero section, you can just multiply it by arbitrary functions and span a uh, line bundle, which is trivial. It's trivial because it has a global frame given by the Exactly. And then if you have a bunch of, but then you can subtract that off, that trivial bundle. Exactly. You just keep going till you get to k equals m. Yeah. Uh, so the proof is again along the same lines. The co-dimension of image of sigma intersection E naught uh, with sigma and E naught the same as what they were here is going to be 2m, which implies that the dimension of this object is zero. So it's a set of discrete points. And finally, if k is less than m, uh, generic sections vanish along a submanifold. M of dimension the, of the submanifold being at most M minus K. Hmm? Exactly. We had another theorem that the intersection of two transverse Submanifold, embedded submanifolds is an embedded submanifold. Oh, well, this theorem itself, but it had two statements. Think of a line bundle on a, on a two-dimensional manifold. The generic section will vanish along the 
also comes in her. Getting close to KTV. So the, the meaning of the term is that you can study like the general classification of bundles by saying that it's not so interesting to study bundles with range of design, like range is higher than the range of Yeah. You know, basically it's the marginal based on something interesting that doesn't have to be a bundle, Because if if it's too high, you can just it's going to be something times a trivial bundle. And if you are going to study uh, bundles of high ranks, then uh, you should keep in mind that they always contain trivial species of bundles. So if you're, when you're studying bundles of high ranks, you are actually studying bundles of low ranks up to an addition of the trivial bundle. And that's the idea. Yeah. Is it a prediction that we have to have the trivial bundle? We'll get there. Um, we have a Another definition called stable is isomorphism of vector bundles over a fixed phase manifold M. Uh, so let's say E prime and E double prime are two vector bundles over the same base M, and they're said to be stably isomorphic denoted by E prime tilde S, E double prime, if there exist bundles, well, vector bundles, uh, G prime and G double prime, such that the Whitney sum of E prime and G prime is isomorphic to the Whitney sum of E double prime and G double prime. So if I can add two vector bundles to make these two vector bundles isomorphic to each other, they are said to be stably isomorphic. Uh, we, have a we have another corollary of, well, I erase that thing with the previous theorem. Mm -hmm. So every every vector bundle is stably isomorphic to the trivial bundle. No, wait. Can we say every vector bundle is stably isomorphic to every other vector bundle? Wait. When you, when you mention stable isomorphism, do these G and G, G prime and G double prime have to be trivial bundles, or they have to be trivial bundles, right? Yeah, they have to be trivial. Yeah, uh, uh, otherwise K-theory would just be trivial. <laughs> There's just one element, <laughs> one stable isomorphism class. Yeah. <laughs> no, but then you wouldn't, wouldn't have any index theorems. All right, anyway. Uh, so corollary is given a vector bundle E, if we find E prime and E double prime such that, uh, well, such that E prime and E double prime trivialize E under Whitney sum. So if E and E. Oh, okay. Such that E direct sum E prime is trivial and the direct sum the double prime is trivial then we have the following E direct sum E prime, direct sum E double prime, where this thing is trivial. By associativity, this is equal to 
e direct sum e well rather commutative but e, double prime direct sum e prime but this is also trivial so we found two trivial bundles uh, such that adding them to e double prime and e prime respectively uh, did you an isomorphism between vector bundles. Exactly. So then E prime is going to be stably isomorphic to E double prime. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Another notion. Replace this condition by instead of g and g prime and g prime prime being in trivial bundles, you can acquire them to be the same trivial bundle. Yeah. Same way. So this is separate equivalence class, right? First, I just can separate Yeah, yeah. So that. Yeah, in this case, like e e prime and e two two different vector bundles can be stably isomorphic even if they have different di different ranks. But in that definition, they'd have to have the same rank. So, so that's saying that that like strong um, or strong conversion of stabilizing everything is equivalent to this one modulo uh, for each sum by trivial bundle. I don't think so. I think it's. So more in the construction mm -hmm. I mentioned. So now, to, to motivate the K group, I'm going to like first come up with a problem. Uh, suppose E direct sum E prime is trivial. Uh, is there a way to, can I can we relate the stable isomorphism class of E to the stable isomorphism class of E prime, where this the square brackets in the stable isomorphism class. And to do that, we introduce K groups. So a K group is the set of stable isomorphism classes of vector bundles over some Bayes manifold M. Uh, this is a group under the Whitney sum plus. Um, the inverse is defined as follows. So let's say you have a stable isomorphism class of some vector bundle E. The inverse is defined that as the stable isomorphism class such that the Whitney sum with this vector bundle gives you a trivial bundle or the stable isomorphism class of the trivial bundle. Exactly, exactly. Or do we not count for zero rank zero bundles? <laughs> yeah, we don't count. Well, we saw that we saw we saw that they exist, right? Yeah. Exactly. So just whatever e prime you found there, just consider it st stable isomorphism class, and that would be the inverse element. Uh, so this is denoted by K O M. Oh, because we're only considering zero. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, well, there's there's a K which is for complex. Yeah, if, if we were considering complex vector bundles over the same manifold, it would be called K tilde of M. Um, so the tilde represents the fact that it's a reduced K group. I don't even know what an unreduced K group is. Ah, okay. Yeah, forget about Z. And turns out that this K is a functor from the category of smooth manifolds or, well, vector, vector bundles, right? Or smooth manifolds. From the category of smooth manifolds uh, into the category of groups. Hmm? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and this is basically the fundamental object in K theory. Yeah. yeah, so we can finally answer this question and say that the stable isomorphism class of E prime is nothing but the inverse of the stable isomorphism class of E in, this, in the K group. What do you mean? Exactly. It's just all all possible vector bundles above M. We try to take something like one kilo times K equals M, then uh, all of the original structure past there is encoded by the single bonus concept. Oh, yeah. Or maybe like there's some, so they may add some connectors to make it a connector. Is that some terminating trait of vector bundles? Yeah. 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 Ye
we come to this thing called what periodicity. <laughs> Have you heard what? I'm going to write down a giant table. Bear with me. Same thing. Yeah. So, what periodicity is a statement that the k groups of uh, the n spheres are periodic in n, and they follow this. So, if if n is if n is eight times something plus one, the k group will be z two. Similarly, for eight times something plus two, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, a couple of points about this: the fact that the k group of S1 is Z2 is uh, indicative of the fact that there's only one non trivial uh, vector bundle over S1, which is the Mobius band, uh, and yeah, up to addition of trivial bundles. And this encodes the fact that uh, the Whitney sum of two Mobius bands is a trivial band, uh, is a trivial bundle. Which is the plane bundle over S1. Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Well, the, because like you can cover the circle with three those three patches, and it's the transition functions just turn out to be dependent on. Just three different choices. Uh, no, just the, the trivial group. Yeah. Right. And um, so recall that uh, ISO classes of general fiber bundles over. Uh, Sn with fiber F and structure group G is given by the corresponding homotopy group pi n minus one of G. Uh, we did this a long time ago when we studied the relation between the transition functions, uh, isomorphism classes of transition functions and how they're related to homotopies. But for simply connected G. Yes, for, for simply connected G. Yes, for connected G. Is this the conjugate Yes, exactly. Uh, so we had this result. And what periodicity is a statement that So for, for vector bundles, G has to be OK for uh, because you can always pick a basis for the vector bundle, and the structure group has to be in your map. And then if you normalize the basis, uh, it reduces to OK if K is the rank of the, uh, of the vector bundle. Uh, so what periodicity is the statement? that uh, the, the higher homotopy groups of the group OK uh, have this periodic, periodic structure for sufficiently large K.
Yes. But yeah, so I... I hmm? Yeah. Why, why does this have to be sufficiently large? Because you need to add a sufficiently large to your little bundle. Ah, I see. I see. I see. Yeah. I mean, K theory doesn't... The K group doesn't... Isn't about isomorphism classes of vector bundles. It's about stable isomorphism classes. Which means you have to add trivial bundles to whatever vector bundle you have. So this this periodicity holds as long as you can add these trivial bundles. That's actually exactly why in all of this it's called stable. Because that periodicity is not always true, but it eventually becomes true for large k. So it's stable. Okay, so the structure of this building vector bundles yeah. the, the k group only cares about things that are stable. Exactly. In fact, like what periodicity is often also a statement as a sta uh, stated as a statement for O infinity, which is like a limit, the limit of O k is defined in some in some way. So like literally as k goes to infinity. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Are your vector bundles looking for dense matter applications big enough that this is applicable? Is that the question? But, I mean, I don't know if it's really, I mean, it seems like this is just a general statement about the structure in large K. Yeah. I don't know if you, you're on your own. Just, so just to wrap up, one more definition, which is very similar to that of a K group, uh, which is the Picard group. Uh, denoted by pick of M. Uh, these are isomorphism classes of line bundles above M. Um, this is going to be a group under the Whitney product instead of the Whitney sum. Uh, the identity element, what is the identity element? <laughs> exactly, just n cross r. Uh, now, re recall that the dual bundle can be defined for a vector bundle E uh, by whose fibers are the dual spaces of the vector space of the typical fiber. And uh, this is going to be the inverse in the Picard group of the isomorphism class of E. Um, the reason this is true is because the dual bundle had transition functions tau alpha beta inverse. Uh, so if you consider the Whitney product of, of E and E prime, the transition functions are this, these tensor products, which is, yep, exactly. And one more thing, this is an abelian group. Because the tensor product of two one-dimensional vector spaces is abelian. Yeah, K is also abelian.
How many line quadrants do you have over the circle? Exactly. Remember we talked about this. Like, yeah. Yeah. So we, we particular consider to put some particular topological in there and for the most pointers. of those manifolds? Well, it might be something really terrible. Can't be hard at the something. <laughs> Some of those actions. Like, it turns out that not all days that look like the homology that I was asking, it drops up some of the actions that people call them. Uh, and the reason for that is because of the. Because we know that they are close to the way that that's still for homology. Mm -hmm. The reason they're not for homology is because they are not for the best points. Oh, yeah, there's all high school. Yeah, there's 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 high school. Yeah, there